الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا سبلنا الحمد لله الذي هدانا صراطا مستقيما الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله ما آتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا وإن يكاد الذين كفروا ليزلقونك بأبصارهم لما سمعوا الذكر ويقولون إنه لمجنون وما هو إلا ذكر للعالمين من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا مضل له ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا هادي له ومن يتوكل على الله فهو حسبه والله غالب على أمره ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون أما بعد Dear committed Muslims أيها المؤمنون We've been in a mental tug of war, so to speak, with those who have monopolized our Islam. There's a wealthy Wahhabi system or syndicate, let us call it, that purports to speak for genuine Islam and unadulterated Islam. And during these past years, we've tried as much as possible to bring to the attention of the Muslim public and the general public the idiocy of these types of people who have been given in addition to their extensive wealth profound ignorance. They claim in their literature and in their propaganda they claim to be the upholders of what they say is true Islam. And when they say something like this, they also follow it up with those who don't agree with them are outside the pale of Islam. And this is going to be another contribution and another chip at chip away at the edifice of this false Salafi Wahhabi type of claim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the ayat in the Quran, and we refer to the ayat of the Quran first and foremost. Through these ayat, we are provided with guidance. We say that there are hundreds of ayat in the Quran that stimulate our thinking. The Salafi Wahhabi monopoly 
of Islam, not due to their knowledge, there's a deficit of knowledge, but due to their wealth, there's plenty of that to go around. They present themselves as the spokespersons of an Islam that is pure and puritanical. The ayat in the Quran, in their hundreds, tell us to think. If a person wanted to go to these ayat in the hundreds, in which the following words are used, these words and their extractions. يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Look at those ayat in the Qur'an. There was, there's no opportunity here to cover the multitudes of ayat having this word and its likes. And then the word ya'qilun or ta'qilun, tatafakkarun. You think, you reason, tafqahun. You apply your reasoning to reality. Ulul albab, those with profound core thoughts. Now this, these ayat in their hundreds, it seems like the Muslim public mind is on leave if it permits the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and its religious establishment to take over and eclipse all of these ayat in the Qur'an. The first word that was revealed from Allah Jalla wa'ala to mortal beings on earth is iqra. You are commanded, you are ordered to read. Uh, but this doesn't figure in to the propaganda that comes out of the Arabian Peninsula that wants the Muslims to stay profoundly ignorant. إِنَّ فِي ذَٰلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْمُتَوَسِّمِينَ إِنَّ فِي ذَٰلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ إِنَّ فِي ذَٰلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَسْمَعُونَ إِنَّ فِي ذَٰلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْعَالِمِينَ And on and on and on. So when we have a preponderance of ayat, in our sacred and in our immortal guiding book saying one thing and then we have these propagandists in the Arabian Peninsula saying something else we realize we have an issue here now in trying to trace this issue we go back to their key words. You know, they have a key word, as salaf as salih the righteous ancestors or predecessors. Pick your word. Most of their claim is traced back to as salaf as salih Okay, let's go and visit as salaf as salih Let's go back to that first and second and third generation of Muslims and see what we have. Is it what these loud mouths in the Arabian Peninsula, what they are saying? Or is it what we have in front of us in the Book of Allah and in His Prophet? For your information, of course this doesn't come out very clearly in the run-of-the-mill presentation of information but when the Muslims who were relatively speaking a limited number of people in the Arabian Peninsula around the Prophet of Allah may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his when they began to move out into further territories they began to come into contact with other societies and other peoples and other modernities, so to speak. One of the first issues they encountered is the sieve. You know what the sieve is? That very simple instrument 
that you put the grain in it, you put either wheat or you put barley, and you move it back and forth so that you filter out uh, impurities. And then when you, what, what, fa- what, 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 what you do in this process is you differentiate or you separate what is good and edible from what is not whether it's weeds or whether it is pebbles or whether it is some type of other organic manner or not. There was none of that. That did not exist in Al-Hijaz, in this little society of that first generation of Muslims. So when they began to move in different directions into the world, one of the first issues that they encountered was the sieve. And then they began to ask themselves, is, is it permissible to use this? Because in the, in the days of Allah's Prophet, this thing was not used. Now, of course, this can get into a very delicate argument between those who say that if you... And by the way, if we want to take the sieve as an example in those days, in our time it would be equivalent to the filter. Whatever filter you use nowadays, is this Islamically permissible or not? And so some individuals said, no, we we prefer not to use it because it wasn't used in the time of Allah's Prophet. And others said, no, no, there's nothing wrong with that. We can use it. There's, it doesn't violate any of our Islamic principles or our Islamic commitments. This was just the beginning of committed Muslims coming in contact with societies that are more developed than they were. And then we have another issue that they encountered, and that is, is it permissible now that they are in what used to be the civilization of Persia or the civilization of Byzantium or the civilization of Egypt or the civilization of India, etc., etc. Another issue they encountered is they realized that rulers, they have a very fancy appear, appearance. The, the rulers are not like, they don't dress like the average person. They wear jewelry, they have security. So the Muslims in that, at that moment of contact, first contact, at that moment, they also began to have difference of opinion. All of these Muslims are as salaf as salih the ones who are having these different points of judgment on these matters are all as salaf as salah there's not not one particular strain there that has a monopoly on being the true representative of all of those individuals in that pioneering generation so some said, no, we can, we can do some of that and we can avoid some of that. This has to do with the public interest and it has to do with necessity. This was how some of them rationalized this. So we find in, in this as salaf as salah that these contemporary Salafi Saudis go to, we find that some of them permitted for the upper class of society. They didn't call it the upper class. They called it the ruling class. They permitted for the ruling class to wear the equivalent of what their equals are wearing outside the realm of Islam. So if their equals are wearing silver and jewelry and gold and this, they made it an exception for the ruler to do the same thing. This comes from as-salaf as-salah. Also, it is haram 
to wear for men to wear silk and to dress up in fashion. That's not part of an Islamic personality. And you may notice, I hope, you can think through the, the fashion fads that today's generation is subjected to. But we are visiting the first generation of Muslims that encountered this type of thing for the first time. So they said, those who are in power, those who make decisions, those who are ruling, they have an exception. Some of these Salafis are saying they have an exception, so they are permitted to do that. And some were saying, no, that's not the case. That wasn't what was done. That's not the character, and it's not the model of Allah's Prophet. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. For those who say, oh, where is this person getting this information from? Go to the book Al-I'tisam by Ash-Shatibi. This is, doesn't come from some fringe group of people. Go to your you who claim that you have a monopoly on speaking for, quote unquote, As-Salaf As-Salah. We refer you to this book Al-I'tisam by Ash-Shatibi. That's not... Uh, controversial personality or a questionable scholar and then in this Salaf al-Salih in the age of the Sahaba Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anh was from a Sahaba Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu was from a Sahaba what happened between these two? Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was appointed the administrator or the governor of Al Kufa. So, what did he do when he got there? He built himself a palace and he excluded himself from the people. He was no longer accessible by the average Muslim. He closed those doors that he had and news of this reached Omar in al Medina. So Omar sent a person by the name of Muhammad ibn Muslima. He said, go when you reach, al go to al Kufa. When you reach al Kufa, burn down the door of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And that's exactly what happened. Now, Umar ibn al-Khattab was from a Salaf al-Salih. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was from a Salaf al-Salih. There's two things going on here. Should we not visit this Salaf al-Salih in its entirety? Or should we just listen to what tho those who right now have locked up as Salaf al Salih in their own books? Uthman ibn Affan was from a Salaf al Salih, just like Omar. Omar told the Sahaba, remain in Al Medina. Don't go unless it's a necessity, unless it's a, a duty. Don't go to these faraway lands. So he restricted them. This was a, an Islamic decision, an Islamic policy. He did that because he didn't want hero worshippers around the domain. And he didn't want them to be corrupted by the materialism that they were going to encounter. That was his ijtihad. Right or wrong, we're not talking about that. But we're talking about something he did, which is a fact in history. Now, Omar is assassinated. Then Uthman occupies the same office. He told the Sahaba, you can go wherever you want to go. Who am I to tell you you can't go wherever you want to go? 
Uthman and Umar, both of them are from the core of As-Salaf As-Salah. One of them said one thing and applied it. The other one said almost the other thing and applied it. So who are you to come to say there is only one opinion that can be traced to this As-Salaf As-Salah? Now, to step outside, uh, as you may notice, as you may have noticed, a lot of controversy and a lot of tension surfaces among the Muslims if we mention some hadiths that are attributed to the Prophet that are contradictory. This raises the sensitivity level. Muslims become allergic to this. So we don't want to do that as far as the Prophet is concerned. We've probably did it on other occasions to show that not all hadiths are authentic and reliable and trustworthy hadiths. Not all of them. And it has nothing to do with Allah's Prophet who is Masu. It has more to do with those individuals who took it upon themselves to collect the hadiths of the Prophet. But we go to Ibn Mas'ud, one of the well-known Sahabis. And we find in our history books, we find he has a contradictory opinion. And that probably has nothing to do with him as much as it does with those who relayed this news item from it. One of them says, Ibn Mas'ud says, إِيَّاكُمْ وَأَرَأَيْتْ أَرَأَيْتْ I caution you about what do you think about such and such a matter? Or let us assume such and such a thing. Things that begin to have the mind work. He said, don't do that. فَإِنَّمَا هَلَكَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ بِأَرَأَيْتْ أَرَأَيْتْ Those who came before you were ruined because they assumed things. Because they said, let us say or let us think in such a manner. وَلَا تَقِيسُ شَيْئًا don't use analogy. فَتَزِلَّ قَدَمٌ بَعْدَ ثُبُوتِهَا Because you are bound to fall. وَإِذَا سُئِلَ أَحَدُكُمْ عَمَّا لَا يَعْلَمْ فَلْيَقُلْ لَا أَعْلَمْ فَإِنَّهُ ثُلُثُ الْعِلْمِ And if one of you was asked about something you knew nothing about, you say, I don't know. Because saying, I don't know, is one-third of the knowledge. Now this is one statement which means Ibn Mas'ud is not encouraging anyone to think. Now, we go to another one of his quotes. And by the way, this, these quotes are taken from one of the most reliable scholars on Salafi history, one of the references in the Salafi library. And that's Ibn al-Qayyim in his book, A'lam al-Muwaqi'een. And he says in this, Ibn Mas'ud once again, the first one, he doesn't encourage anyone to venture out with their mind and do some thinking. You say, if you don't, simply, if you don't know something, don't think through it, say, I don't know, and finish there. And the other statement he says, إِنَّهُ قَدْ أَتَى عَلَيْنَا زَمَنٌ وَلَسْنَا نَقْضِي at one time, there was a time which we did, pa- did not pass judgment. Meaning we didn't think through a particular issue and then judge it in a certain manner. وَلَسْنَا هناك. But now we are not there where we were before. ثُمَّ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَلَّغَنَا مَا تَرَوْنَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has made us reach these areas that we are now in, he's referring to the geographical growth of Islam. فَمَنْ عُرِضَ عَلَيْهِ قَضَاءَ بَعْدَ الْيَوْمِ فَلْيَقْضِي Anyone who has an issue that comes his way should use his better judgment. بِمَا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ According to what is in the book of Allah. 
فإن جاءه أمر ليس في كتاب الله ولا قضى به نبيه صلى الله عليه وسلم فليقضي بما قضى به الصالحون If an issue comes his way and he finds he doesn't have reference in the book of Allah and in the judgment of the Prophet then he should follow what the righteous have done concerning this same affair. فَإِنْ جَاءَهُ أَمْرٌ لَيْسَ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَلَا قَضَى بِهِ نَبِيُّهُ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَلَا قَضَى بِهِ الصَّالِحُونَ فَلْيَجْتَهِدْ رَأْيَهِ If he has another issue that comes to him, but he can't find a reference for it in the book of Allah, nor in the judgment of the Prophet, nor in what those virtuous rulers have ruled in this affair, then he should use his better judgment. فَلْيَجْتَهِدْ رَأْيَهِ وَلَا يَقُلْ إِنِّي أَرَى وَإِنِّي أَخَافِ He should not say, I think this matter is this way, but I, but, but I fear. فَإِنَّ الْحَلَالَ بَيِّنْ وَالْحَرَامَ بَيِّنْ Halal is very obvious indeed, and what is haram is very obvious indeed. وَبَيْنَ ذَلِكَ أُمُورٌ مشتبهات. Between the two there are gray areas, issues in gray areas. فَدَعْ مَا يُرِيبُكْ إِلَى مَا لَا يُرِيبُكْ You part with things that are doubtless to things that are certain. These are two statements from the same person belonging to As-Salaf As-Salah. So what, what have they to say, these people today who are promoting this ignorance among the Muslims? What have they to say concerning these issues? أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم أدعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله إن الله تواب رحيم الحمد لله بجميع المحامد على جميع النعم وصلى الله وسلم على المبعوث خيرا ورحمة وهدى لكافة الأمم محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Dear brothers and sisters There are consequences when we speak about these people who want to cage our minds There are consequences for that You know, Muslims are people of a conscience and a high moral standard. It's not easy for a committed Muslim to see all of the crimes and all of the instability and all of the imposed harm on us without having a say into these matters. People who have political responsibilities, economic responsibilities, military responsibilities. They are not above the moral law. What do we have? What is happening in our real world? Because there is a combination of wealth and power, and that combination of wealth and power shuts down the Muslim intellect, it turns it off. So what happens as, what are the symptoms of our collective ignorance in the world? One of the things that has been going on for the past few weeks in the Holy Land, Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa, there's a law that's being passed that says to the Muslims, you cannot... Say your adhan using a loudspeaker or a microphone or an amplifier. You cannot do that. You want to say your adhan? 
You go up to your minaret, go up the mi'zana, you stand there and you say it with your raw voice if you want to say your adhan. That's all you can do. This is a symptom of the ignorance that is at our core, that is nurtured by Islamic centers like the one we are in. People come to it ignorant and they leave it ignorant. Just a couple of days ago, one of the, one of the famous Saudi scholars, may you might call him an enlightened Salafi, was taken off Twitter. He has two million followers and they pulled the plug on him. The Saudi government pulled the plug on him and said you cannot use this form of communication. What was the reasons they gave, the Saudi government gave for doing this? Remember, this, is, this person is one of them. He said, you could jeopardize public order and provoke public opinion. That's a reminder of what happened over here. Exact words, you could jeopardize public order and provoke public opinion. They followed that by saying, you could affect the relationship of the people with the leadership. And the relationship of Saudi Arabia with other countries. This person was tried in court. It is said he was fined 100,000 Saudi riyals, which is about 27,000 U.S. dollars. But he wasn't taken to prison. And he says he's appealing this case. This is what happens when we have an ignorant Muslim public. And what, what, do you hear this in the news? Anyone speaking about freedom of expression in Saudi Arabia? Or they want to cover up, they want to hide the private parts, the nasty private parts of that Arabian regime. And then we had four, at least 44 Somalis that were killed by a helicopter raid. One news source says the helicopter was unidentified. Another news source said that the helicopter was a Saudi Arabian helicopter. At least 44 Somalis who were making their way in the waters off the coast of Yemen going from Yemen to Sudan, and they were killed just like that in the past 24 hours or so. Where is the Muslim, where is the Muslim moral consciousness? Where is the Muslim mental consciousness on this affair and, like, and affairs like this? Yesterday, 42 Muslims were praying in a masjid in Syria. And then they were bombed and killed while they were praying. Some news sources say they can't confirm who dropped the bombs. Other news sources say that the U.S. dropped those bombs. Isn't this something that should raise our moral attention? Isn't this some type of crime? Are those involved in this beyond the law? When the Qataris buy real estate in London and they own more real estate in London than the Queen of Britain owns, then we ask why, where, this, where do they get this money? This money belongs to their personal selves or does it belong to the rest of the Muslims? In this country, Muslims in this country, we have Muslims and non-Muslims, we have right now an administration that is cutting the budgets of housing and urban development, of the Environmental Protection Agency. It is taking away some benefits, legal benefits for veterans. It is taking away benefits from those who are disabled. It is trying to cut down on the insurance accessibility of the average person 
in this country and we Muslims have nothing to say about this? No conscience? Latinos now are afraid to go to soccer matches or to sports stadiums. They are afraid to go to church services because in the back of their mind it may be raided and they may be thrown out of the country. In Europe, all, all of these types of things are symptoms of the Saudi Salafi monopoly on what is Islam and what Islam is not. In Europe, the judiciary there said an employed Muslim woman is not allowed to wear her scarf or her hijab. And then there's, no, there's not a type of collective Islamic response to all of that. And then we see the results of deprived societies. In the past couple of days, in Jordan itself, a husband, and the, before I say this, the economic conditions in Jordan are deteriorating. People are under, in a pressure cooker. No one knows when this issue is going to explode in that country. And in these types of conditions where you know, we say, Al Muslim wa Akhul Muslim, a Muslim is a brother to a Muslim. Where's this brotherhood when it counts, when you need it? These are people in need. So what, what's happening in there? A husband burns his wife. And then the wife is taken to the hospital. And during her treatment, she files a legal case against her husband. And then she dies. She's in her 50s. And then she dies. And then the husband says there was a dispute in the household. And that's what he did. And on another occasion, a woman in her 60s and her grandson, three-year-old, were stabbed and the woman's brother stabbed and killed both of them. Another, I mean, something like this, maybe if it happens in some materialistic society, oh, that's, you know, average news. But something like this that happens in what is considered to be conservative Islamic cultures should raise some eyebrows. It should poke some consciences around. It doesn't do any of that. The wars that are imposed on us have resulted, a new survey came out, it indicated that in Iraq, well, let's begin with Lebanon. In Lebanon, 85% of the women eligible for marriage are not married. 85%. In Iraq, it's 70%. Something is going on here. These are real economic, social family, psychological issues. We don't need a psychologist to come and tell us that in a society like Jordan, boys are nurtured, they're brought up in their families to be superior than their sisters in the family. So once they grow up and they become men, they th still think that they are superior and they can do to their Womenhood, their wives, their sisters, their daughters, their aunts, whoever, they can do whatever they want. There's something wrong. There's something terribly wrong. And we can trace all of it to the emptiness, the vacuity in these masajid and in our collective mind. اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم اهدنا فيمن هديت 
وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي ولا يقضى عليك وإنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تباركت ربنا وتعاليت فلك الحمد على ما قضيت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون يعلم خائنة الأعين وما تخفي الصدور أقم الصلاة وأرحنا بها